Can J.D. Bertrand be Captain America for the Falcons' defense? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as the playoffs wind down and sports stop sporting like we want them to. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a bonus or boost daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black, a.k.a. the Jolly Great Giant, a.k.a. the Iron That Sharpens the Iron, a.k.a. Mr. A.k.a. And of course, I've been covering the Falcons for a lifetime, formerly at Falcfans.com, RIP, still going strong in this illustrious podcast. And I thank each and every one of you that go strong with me as everydayers. That means you make this podcast your first watch or your first listen each and every day. And all you got to do to become an illustrious everydayer is subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So today's episode is our full breakdown of J.D. Bertrand. I've finished the tape. And uh, we'll talk some NFL player comparisons, look at his floor, his ceiling, his eye level in terms of what he projects to be, sort of talk about what his role will be in Atlanta. But first, let's start off the conversation talking about his skill set. And, you know, the more I watch J.D. Bertrand, the more he grew on me as I watched more and more film of him, sort of initially kind of going into it after sort of my initial sort of watch of him, uh, you know, draft weekend was like, OK, this is probably going to be a career backup, special teams player, very limited upside to start. But the more I watch, the more I'm like, there's there's probably a little bit more starting potential for him than I initially thought going into it. Um, I think ultimately my biggest concern sort of going into this process was, does he have the type of athleticism that you really kind of need to be a successful linebacker uh, in today's NFL? And I thought he's a good enough athlete, right? We don't know exactly how good enough an athlete he is just because he didn't test deal due to a foot injury that he suffered this off season. So we didn't get him at the pro day. We didn't get him at the combine or nothing like that. But my guesstimation, just watching the film is he's probably like running a 40 in a four, six range, which is solid for a a, a linebacker. It's it's above average speed for a linebacker. You know, my guess is that his 40 time would have been somewhere between like four, five, eight and four, six, eight somewhere in that range so some are probably in the four six range and piggybacking on a point that we heard from locked on irish host tyler wojack on uh, friday's episode sort of that he would have surprised many folks and I, I think that was probably the case you know i think with bertrand i think his straight line speed i think is good enough um to me the the big question when it comes to athleticism was the change of direction ability and that really sort of manifests itself potentially in uh coverage right where i just don't know if he has the great sort of ability to you know agility whatever you want to call it to change direction and and be able to maintain a high rate of speed like you need to especially in coverage at the nfl um now in the eight games i watched it like he didn't give up a ton of completions in those games um but i do think with the uptick in caliber of athlete that he's going to probably be covering a lot of those being running backs because that's sort of the central responsibility of linebackers in most coverage schemes. Like the the jump from the c- typical college running back to the NFL running back that you're going to face as a starting uh, defensive player, you know, is going to be significant. And so I do think he'll be limited in that capacity as a coverage player. Uh, the thing about Bertrand is like, you know, while I think he's a good enough athlete, like there's nothing about his athleticism that is a plus, Right. That you know he's undersized. He got a, he looks small on the field. He has short arms, eighth percentile. You know he didn't miss a ton of tackles. I think mostly because of how technical and sound a tackler he is. So he's able to make the most of it, despite not necessarily having the biggest frame, despite not having the longest arms, which we know uh, the Falcons. Raheem Morris has commented on this before, where like you know length is correlated to tackling ability. Like you know, you can wrap up guys if you have you know, longer arms than a guy who has, you know, T-Rex arms and whatnot. It's harder for that person to wrap up, you know, 230 pound running backs or 250 pound tight ends or 200 pound wide receivers, et cetera. Um, But, you know, I think what Bertrand does is he does, he's willing to hit guys, right? You know, he's able to generate some force 
you know, he doesn't have a ton of mass, uh, 235 pounds, but he can accelerate at a decent clip. Again, not, you know, he's not the fastest linebacker in the history of the world or anything. But as we know from physics class, it's the one thing I learned in my AP physics class uh, <laughs> that's still with me today. Force equals mass times acceleration, right? And so, you know, he can generate some force because he can accelerate his mass. Um, now, I think when it comes to the instincts part of J.D. Burch and games, which gets a lot of like his instincts are fine. Like there's nothing bad about his instincts. There's nothing like exceptional about his instincts. Like I wouldn't sit here and go like, oh, he's a super instinctual linebacker. But what I will say is it's clear that he does his homework. He does his film study, right? Like watching the eight games I saw, you know, like he's rarely out of position, but I wouldn't necessarily be like, oh yeah, he's Ray Lewis or he's Luke Keekley or, or somebody like that who's very instinctual linebacker or something like that. Uh, that is sort of like anticipating where the ball is going to go and, and all these various things. But he, he definitely has good instincts, but nothing exceptional in that regard. And so, you know, he's the type of guy that is a do your job type of football player. Right. And that's the type of football player that endears him to coaching staffs because they're like, yeah, he's going to do his job. He's going to, you know, do all the things that he needs to do, you know, check all the character boxes. Another thing that the Falcons uh, sort of covet. Uh, and have con consistently coveted, you know, with Terry Fontenot as the general manager, and, and probably that's not going to go anywhere with Raheem Morris coming to town anyway. Um, so, like, yeah, he he checks those boxes as far of it. And again, like, there's nothing sort of exciting about him from a physical standpoint or or whatever. But like, he's kind of your stereotypical sort of guy that I'm I'm going to make up the difference with just being tough as nails, right? You know, he's got that same sort of mentality that always sort of endears me to players watching these guys. I remember this being a thing with Keanu Neal. I remember talking about this back way back in 2017 and comparing Keanu Neal and Deion Jones during their rookie years. And it's like you put an obstacle in front of Keanu Neal, he's going to go through that obstacle. Like if there's an obstacle between him and the football, he's going through that. If it's a 320 pound offensive lineman, doesn't matter if it's a brick wall, he's going through that wall to get to that football. Deion Jones is more the type of guy that's you know going to go around that obstacle. And that's fine. But, you know. Sometimes you you want that sort of harder edge, and Bertrand has more of that Keanu Neal obstacle where it's like I'm gonna go through you. Um, I'm gonna you know I'm willing to run into that brick wall. You know whether that is conducive to a long NFL career, that type of mentality. Pro you know we we could probably have a conversation about that. Whether that you know that's something that you want to have if if you want to play you know for seven to ten years in the NFL or, or whatever. But it it is something that makes it fun to watch you play football right you know at the end of the day this is entertainment as you know so that's what i kind of appreciated with him you know he has the toughness he has the physicality you know he is the sort of stereotypical tough you know sort of guy undersized guy like it's not to the degree of rudy or anything like that but like he does look small on the field right and that's at college and they only get bigger in the nfl you know in terms of people so like he's going to be that sort of stereotypical undersized but, you know, good enough athlete that can make up for it with toughness. And so when when Raheem Morris calls him Captain America, like I call him more Steve Rogers. Right. And that's the, sort of the difference between the two. If you know anything about the character, like, you know, Captain America has the super soldier serum. You know, he's bigger, stronger, faster than everybody else. And Steve Rogers is the guy that has the heart of Captain America, but not the physicality of Captain America. And so that to me is what. J.D. Bertrand is. He's Steve Rogers. He's the guy that's getting pushed around in the alley, you know, and saying, like, I, I can do this all day. Like, that's what J.D. Bertrand to me is not necessarily Captain America. So, you know, I get the the comparison, but, you know, that's sort of how you have to think about um, J.D. Bertrand. I think it's think of him as Steve, Steve Rogers. Again, maybe not as scrawny as Steve Rogers, clearly, you know, but like, you know, a little undersized, but, you know, has a heart of gold type of guy. So now that we know what type of player J.D. Bertrand is, what is sort of the role that he is going to have uh, here in Atlanta, what can we expect from him? Is he just purely a backup type of player, or is there more sort of untapped potential for him to be a starter? We'll break that down as we continue today's Locked On Falcons. Now, guys, summertime is great for a lot of things, but it's not always great for sports because, you know, things are starting to dry up. Baseball's still going strong, but, you know, we're getting fewer and fewer games. You know, playoffs are done for some of the other major sports, and sports aren't just sporting like they used to. And FanDuel is here to keep the party going. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Head on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on, and then you can make the most out of your summer. And whether you want to bet on baseball with the Braves seemingly getting back into their groove, the upcoming NFL season, the upcoming NBA season, you want to bet on Zachary Risache 
as the uh, offensive rookie of the year or wh- whatever the award is in the NBA. Again, it's a football podcast. You know, go check it out at FanDuel. You know, they got player specials for Kirk Cousins, how many yards, how many touchdowns he's going to throw, all that and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make the most out of your summer. FanDuel is an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. And guys, I want to tell you about the Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you each and every day to bring you the big stories, news, opinions, analysis, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. It's all part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So when it comes to J.D. Bertrand, what are my expectations? I expect him to be a backup, right? You know, but I do think there is more potential than I initially thought that he could be a starter, right? It's it's a maybe, right? Well, if you ask me, could he be a starter here in Atlanta? Maybe. It just kind of depends on circumstances. But I think in general, my my sort of overall feelings on J.D. Bertrand are similar to my feelings on Michael Walker a couple of years ago. My feelings on Nate Lamon currently is I think these are more guys that you start because you don't have better options, not because you start them because they're necessarily a good option. Right. And, you know, that doesn't make them bad players, as we saw with Nate Lamon being very productive this past year. But there are players that are limited in a lot of ways. And you just don't want to build your defense around limited players. Right. In an ideal world, if you have a plan A, right, your plan A is like we're not going to have any limitations when it comes to building our defense. But we know that circumstances dictate that you can't always get what you want. Right. You know, plan A is not always going to come to fruition. So sometimes you got to settle for plan B and plan C. And that's where the Nate Lamons and the Michael Walkers and the J.D. Bertrands, you know, sort of fit into the mix. And, you know, the limitations come because of what I talked about a little bit. You know, you have running backs that are in the NFL that are going to be legit weapons out of the backfield. And you don't necessarily want to put these types of players on them. You got guys like Alvin Kamara and Christian McCaffrey, Austin Eckler, Aaron Jones, Saquon Barkley, several of those guys, the Falcons face this upcoming season, and you don't want to put a linebacker on there that could be, you know, that could be a liability covering those guys. You also have impactful tight ends in the NFL. You got Travis Kelsey, TJ Hawkinson, Pat Fryerman, Dallas Goddard, all of whom are also on the Falcons schedule this year. And if you can't cover those guys, you know, that creates problems for your defense. And then it's like, okay, well, we're not going to put you in coverage. Well, maybe we can put you as a quarterback spot and you can lock down that guy and we go up against a mobile quarterback like a Justin Fields or a Jaden Daniels or a Jalen Hurts. Can you take that guy down in the open field should he escape the pocket? And if the answer is no to any of these questions, and I think that's the case with J.D. Bertrand, it's like, okay, well, you don't really have value on passing downs if you can't check any of those boxes. And so, you know, in a league where 60% of the plays are passes and we're a nickel 70% of the time, and especially for a linebacker, you need, you know, in order to be one of those two linebackers on the field, you know, you have to bring some value on passing downs to stay on the field or else you're getting a hook. It's like, okay, what is it that you do here if you can't do those things, right? And it's not to say like J.D. Bertrand will be a liability in those areas, but it's just like, that's not the plan. Like that's not, again, that's not plan A. There's limitations there, right? And so for me with J.D. Bertrand, it's like, okay, if you if you can't cover running backs, you can't cover tight ends, and you can't spy mobile quarterbacks, what is it that you do? What, you know, the only real thing left for you to do on passing downs which the vast majority of the plays are, is to rush the quarterback. And that's why a player like Kay Nellis, who's not necessarily the world's greatest coverage uh, guy when it comes to running backs and tight ends or, you know, spying mobile quarterbacks in the open field. But what does Kay Nellis do really well? Oh, he can rush the quarterback because, you know, he was a defensive end in college and whatnot, and he was a full-time pass rusher. Um, and so he does have some of that value on third downs that even if he isn't necessarily uh, the world's greatest athlete, although I think he's probably a better athlete than, uh, J.D. Bertrand is, but you know that's the type of value, and I, I do think Bertrand does bring some value as a pass rusher. He's not a pure pass rusher, again, not a true blue defensive end. He's a guy that's getting production off of scheme and effort and unblock pressures and whatnot. I, I counted 27 pass rush wins in the eight games I watched, which is a good number, uh, but about 36 percent of those wins came when he was unblocked. You know, 20 percent of them, uh, or roughly uh, another 20 percent of them came, you know, on stunts and, and schemed up stuff like that. So the majority of his, you know, pass rush production came off of, you know, being unblocked or effort or scheme or, or those types of things rather than necessarily, you know, some great pass rush moves. And so, you know, that's not unique to J.D. Bertrand. You know, Troy Anderson wins in the exact same ways, right? You know, the reason why Troy Anderson is an effective pass rusher is because he can get from point A to point B very quickly. The same thing is true with uh, J.D. Bertrand, um, you know, and then when you have a guy in front of him, as we talked about earlier, like, you know, if there's a running back or an offensive lineman that you need to go through, those guys can go through those guys. The difference between Troy Anderson and J.D. Bertrand 
goes back to the physics thing of force equals mass times acceleration. Troy Anderson can accelerate a lot more mass and so therefore can generate a lot more force in those pass rushing situations or in general any situation than J.D. Bertrand can do. Uh, and so, you know, Bertrand's accelerating less acceleration, less mass, so not generating nearly as much force. Uh, and so, you know, that means to me that he's probably not going to be as effective a pass rusher at the NFL level as he was at the collegiate level. But we'll we'll see on that. So those are the reasons why I think J.D. Bertrand is going to be a lot more limited at the next level, uh, especially as a starter, as a full time, every down linebacker like you're hoping to have. Uh, and so that's why I see him more as a backup. But, you know, injuries happen and all these various things. As we mentioned before, you know, plan A isn't always going to go to fruition. So sometimes you got to go with plan B. And I think that's where a J.D. Bertrand comes in. If you need, uh, you know, a decent fill in starter, I think he can be that type of player. I think that's where his potential lies in. You know, will he ever be a good starter? You know, that remains to be seen. But certainly a guy that you can plug and play for, you know, a week or two, a month or two or, or whatever the case may be. You know, he's not the type of set it and forget it type of starter that when I think of a quality starter, it's like, okay, you set it and forget it. You don't have to worry about that position for two, three, four or more years. You just plug that guy in and you're like, you're good to go. Right. That's not probably going to be J.D. Bertrand. Right. It's going to be like, yeah, you, you you plug and play with him. And then it's like, yeah, I think we can do better than this. You know, and you try to sign a free agent or draft the guy the next year and, and, and try to upgrade that spot. And so. When I think about what he probably will do, so again, I'm not convinced he's going to be a good starter, but I am convinced that he'll be a high-level backup, an impactful special teams player. He can slot in easily and immediately into that fourth linebacker role behind Caden Ellis, behind Troy Anderson, behind Nate Landman. That is primarily a special teams role. You look at last year's fourth linebacker, that was Andre Smith. He did get some action late in the season uh, due to injuries to both you know, Troy Anderson, who missed most of the season, and then Caden Ellis missed some time late in the season, and so that allowed Andre Smith to get on the field alongside Nate Lemon. And then you look at the previous year in 2022's fourth linebacker, that was Nick Klikowski, uh, and he played zero snaps on defense the entire year because, you know, him, Andre Smith, were regulars on special teams. So that's really what that fourth linebacker is there to do. In a, in a perfect world, he can he's going to be your special teams guy, you know, but injuries do happen, as we've seen, and, you know, if you need to plug and play him for a game or two or a month or two, you know, I think J.D. Bertrand can turn into that type of player. And so similar to Smith, you know, he'll play if there are multiple injuries at the linebacker position this upcoming season. You know, I think there's a chance we might see some formations where the Falcons have three line, their top three linebackers on the field at the same time. Caden Ellis more as a pass rusher, Troy Anderson, Nate Lamon in those sort of off ball linebacker roles. But in the event that one of those guys go down, I don't think the Falcons are going to suddenly be like, okay, well, we can still play our three linebacker set with J.D. Bertrand, right? At least not this year. Now, down the road, maybe he can – they'll they'll feel comfortable enough to play him in that situation. But I think that's going to be – if if we do see that, you know, whether it's for two snaps a game or 12 snaps a game, you know, that will be sort of unique to those three players as opposed to J.D. Bertrand being a part of that. But maybe that's something in the future. And so I think this year is really going to be about J.D. Bertrand – kind of getting a red shirt year, go out here, play special teams. Hopefully, you know, we'll be healthy at linebacker this year. You don't have to worry about playing really much defense, you know, put in the film work, you know, that he's going to do that. And so if he does have, if he is forced in the lineup, you know, theoretically, mentally, he's going to be there because, uh, you know, he, he's shown that in college, he's gotten mentors like Sean Lee and Luke Keekley and James Laurinaitis, who, you know, throughout his collegiate career at Notre Dame were, you know, teaching him, you know, how to watch film and how to prepare like a pro. So he has that sort of leg up relative to other players coming into the league. So if the Falcons need him to play, I think he'll be ready to play. But hopefully the Falcons won't need him to play because the rest of the linebackers will be healthy and playing at a high level. And we can just wow when J.D. Bertrand's, you know, you know, they don't have wedges anymore, but, you know, We'll see. We'll see what the new kickoff rules. And so maybe maybe he could be really impactful uh, as a special teams player right off the bat. But speaking of sort of that, you know, in terms of what his future is in the NFL, you know, let's talk about some NFL player comparisons, some pro players that he compares to when we talk about his floor, his ceiling and his eye level. And we'll do that to wrap up today's Locked on Falcon. And guys, I want to tell you that today's episode of the podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And, you know, we're going to be talking about NFL player comparisons, but, you know, sometimes comparison can be the thief of joy, right? Where you're, you know, scrolling through Instagram and you're sort of being envious of other people's lives and you're thinking they got it all put together. And in reality, they probably don't, right? And therapy can help you focus on 
what you want instead of what other people have so that you can start living your best life. And therapy has taught me positive coping skills. Like I can only control what I can control. So I use that every Sunday pretty much when I'm watching the Atlanta Falcons. Can't control whether or not they win these football games, but I can control other things like whether or not I can produce a quality podcast for you every day or is out there. And so if you're thinking of starting therapy for whatever reason, you know, I think you should give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Stop comparing and start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. So let's get into the NFL player comparisons. Let's talk floor, ceiling, and eye level for those of you that are new to this. You know, I like to do a spread of outcomes because, again, we don't know how these players are going to turn out. We don't know how they're going to develop. We don't know how healthy they're going to be. All of these things are unknown variables. You know, what schemes they're going to be playing in in a year or two, what, you know, you know, who the free agents, who they're going to draft, all that stuff. So those are unpredictable. So we do a spread of outcomes and say that this player will be somewhere in, in this area. And we start with the floor, which is to me what he is day one coming into the NFL. This is not a projection on where he'll be a year from now. It's, you know, week one, this is the type of player that you can expect him to perform at. Then we go to the opposite end of the spectrum. The best possible outcome is a ceiling. That's the max development if you know everything goes his way, this is the type of player that he can wind up being. And then the eye level to me is the more likely outcome, right? That means they're going to get some development, but they may not get the perfect max development that they may need in order to reach that ceiling. And as we've discussed on recent episodes, looking back at the six years since I've been doing this as a semi-regular basis, only about 15% of the players that the Falcons have drafted in that period of time, based off my assessment, uh, have reached their ceilings, about 40% have reached their eye levels or higher. Uh, so that means about 60% of the people some come somewhere between their floor and their uh, eye levels. So I guess like waist height or shin height or something like that, uh, if we want to say that. So when we talk about J.D. Bertrand's floor, right, the player I have him comp to is Bryce Hager. Another player I was thinking about was Tyler Matic- Matikiewicz, who also Matikiewicz was a not a great athlete, but wound up being one of the best special teams players in the NFL when he, during his time in Pittsburgh. And the reason why I didn't comp J.D. Bertrand to Medikevich is just because that would, to me, my interpretation of that comp would be like, he's going to be one of the best special team players in the NFL. And I don't know that, right? Like, I think he could be, that's possible, but I don't know that. And so I don't feel comfortable projecting that as floor. So I, instead I went with Bryce Hager, um, former Ram, solid special teams player, spent six years in the NFL, primarily with the special teams value as a plus contributor in that regard, but didn't really do a whole lot as a defensive contributor, played a couple of snaps here or there throughout his career, but nothing real serious in that regard. But, you know, when he did get on the field was functional as a productive player. And so I think that's what JD Bertrand's floor is going to be a guy that has a playing personality that works really well for special teams. Again, he's the guy that's going to, you know, he's got the edge to him that, you know, as they say, psychopathy, you kind of need that Uh, just a little bit, a hint of that. If you're going to play linebacker, especially, uh, just to be like, yeah, you know, I'm going to constantly be, you know, dealing with 300 pound offensive linemen and I'm 235 pounds and these guys outweigh me by 80 plus pounds. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not scared. I'm, I'm going right through you. So that type of mentality works really well on special teams because you, you got to run full speed and try to hit another guy who's running full speed at you. It's, you know, you got to be a little bit of a psychopath. So I think J.D. Bertrand has just a little bit, right? A little bit of that psychopathy. Uh, you know, in him. So that will make him a valuable special teams contributor right away. Looking at the opposite end of the spectrum, the ceiling for me is Blake Martinez. Um, And other players I thought about, you know, Drew Tranquil, Alex Anzalone, Matt Milano. These are sort of the guys that are, you know, not necessarily the world's greatest athletes at the linebacker position, but have carved out nice careers as starters, right? And Tranquil, you know, to me, it seems like a lazy comp because they both went to Notre Dame. Tranquil played some safety at college and so I think had a little bit more upside as a coverage guy. And we've seen that play out in his NFL career. You know, Matt Milano, to me, was a lot more physical, even though he wasn't the world. He was like 220, 225 playing at Boston College. He reminded me kind of of the ACC's Levante David as those little really undersized linebackers, but, you know, could hit you, right? Could really hit you. Uh, and played like they were 250 pounds, but somehow you're like, how's this guy only 220 pounds? So I, I don't see that quite with J.D. Bertrand, so I didn't make that Milano comparison. 
Anzalone makes a lot more sense because I do think their play style is a little bit very similar, right? And if you've ever watched Alex Anzalone playing for the Saints or the, or the Lions, you kind of know what J.D. Bertrand's play style is. I think Anzalone is probably a little bit bigger, uh, a little bit better in coverage, but very similar in that regard. And so ultimately I settled on Blake Martinez just because Blake Martinez is kind of like, to me, again, other opinions may vary, kind of the, the lesser of, of this quartet of guys. He's kind of the more vanilla of this group, you know, of of the most vanilla of the vanilla uh, linebackers that we're talking about here. But he was very productive in the NFL. You know, would I say Blake Martinez is good? In my opinion, not really, but I'm sure other people, you know, thought more highly of him than than I do. It was like he was was a productive player. He wasn't bad or anything like that. It was just like, yeah, he's fine. Uh, And that to me is like if J.D. Bertrand does become a regular starter like these guys have been, like he's going to be more of that Blake Martinez. Like, yeah, is he good? I don't know. He's fine. He does. He gets his job done. He gets a ton of tackles. Like he's constantly around the ball. So like, we'll take that, you know, like we could probably do better as, as the, the Packers have thought in recent years with Quay Walker and, and Payne Devon, Jerry Campbell, but you know, trying to get better athletes at that position than Blake Martinez brings to the table. But like, you know, that's kind of how I see JD Bertrand. Like, okay, like maybe, maybe, you know, everything works out you might be able to plug and play with him as a starter for three or four years. Maybe you could set it and forget it. Although I don't think you're actually going to forget it. That's, that's kind of the point I'm trying to make with Blake Martinez. It's like, are you, you know, like, it's like, we can do better than this. Can't we? But that's kind of how I see JD Bertrand as his max potential, but that's still point being, that's a good player. So where, where does the sort of mid point, where's that eye level? I went with another Ram player. That's Troy reader. I know he was a player that, you know, uh, Raheem Morris spoke highly about when he started for them during that Super Bowl year at the linebacker position, but he wasn't, it goes back to my earlier point about he wasn't their plan A. Um, he was more their plan B. There was like, you know, the Rams were kind of cutting corners. Like they were paying a lot of money to certain players on defense, like Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey. And they were like, Oh, it just, we'll just plug and play with, you know, in Troy Reader's cases, undrafted free agent, some day three starters at various positions. You've kind of seen that trend in LA the last couple of years. And that's kind of where Troy Reader was for them and you know he started for like one or two years and then they kind of moved on and like that's kind of what i sort of expect if jd bertrand starts going back to the earlier point like he starts because you don't have a better option not because he's a good option and that to me is probably what jd bertrand will be troy reader was a productive backup special teams performer good fill-in starter is basically how you summarize troy reader's career uh these last you know five six years and in LA. And I think that's probably what the next five or six years will be for JD Bertrand here in Atlanta, right? You know, you can plug and play with him, but you're, he's not your plan A at that position. So we'll see, you know, what JD Bertrand t- turns into. I, I think the type of player he is there have, as I mentioned, several examples of players that have turned into effective starters in the NFL, but you know, he's more likely to be that Troy reader, David Mayo, Nick Kwiatkowski type of player um, then probably the guy that's, you know, racking up 120 tackles every single year. But, you know, lacking that top in trait, I think, is is going to hold him back. But, you know, he can make up for it with character, um, you know. But at the end of the day, character and, and work ethic and all these things aren't going to cover Alvin Kamara. They're not going to cover, you know, Austin Eckler or Saquon Barkley, right? And the thing with J.D. Bertrand um, is not only will he probably struggle against that higher caliber of running back, particularly in coverage, you know, probably the mid-tier guys, the Jamal Williamses, the Brian Robinsons as well. Good running backs, obviously productive NFL pros, but not necessarily the top-tier guys. Like Bertrand's probably not going to match up well with those guys. Again, he probably won't be a liability against, again, I think he's a good enough athlete, but he won't be a liability against those guys. But the mismatch will favor the offensive player as opposed to the defensive player. And again, that's not the way that you ideally would want to build your, your defense. That's more like, well, that's the best option we got type of, of, of movement. So that's what I kind of so foresee uh, J.D. Bertrand being. So, you know, it's hard to kind of be precise on exactly where his potential is just because we don't know the uh, the exact athleticism and, you know, the value of athleticism is like, you know, most of the good starters in the NFL tend to be higher end athletes, you know, 75th percentile, 80th percentile or better. Um, you know, the guys that are the sort of plug and play set in and forget it starters. And uh, since we don't know that 100% about J.D. Bertrand because he didn't test, you know, it's hard to truly project that for him. We'll get to see him later this summer on the football field, and we'll really see how his, his, his athleticism stacks up against, you know, NFL caliber players in the preseason. So that will be something to look forward to. But those are my thoughts on J.D. Bertrand. I hope you guys uh, continue to make Lockdown Falcons your first listen. We'll still get through the last, what, three draft picks over the next 
two weeks probably uh, and, and get through that before we get to training camp. So continue to make Lockdown Falcons your first listen. Make sure you subscribe, follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out Lockdown Sports Today, Lockdown Sports Atlanta, Lockdown Hawks, Lockdown Braves, Lockdown Bulldogs. It's all part of Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.